So again, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Arn van Alstafjord, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation. And I lead the training and certification arm of the consortium. And the consortium is a nonprofit alliance of member companies developing innovative ways to improve engagement. And it's in a variety of areas. So it could be customer service, HR support, IT support, sales, and customer success, to name a few. And it's great. We're always hearing about new applications of um, our work. And predominantly, whenever there's a requester responder, we're seeing that uh, KCS and our other technologies are working very well, our other methodologies. And we're funded predominantly by our member companies. So for the next slide, um, and we'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. And included here are the benefactor and sponsor level members. So really want to thank them. Uh, and then also want to make sure you're aware of upcoming events. So on September 21st, uh, Amy Dotson from SMARS, Christina Rusin from Akamai, and I'll be uh, joining also. And we'll have a discussion on good, better, and best practices for measuring self-service success and uh, the related measures. And we get this often. We see this in chat for the KCS in actions. Um, how do you measure self-service success? Some talk about case deflection and such. Um, and we've uh, this has been a big focus for the consortium. So we're going to share the work there. And then on October 19th, we'll be hosting the very popular KCS roundtables, where we give you an opportunity to ask questions to expert practitioners on a um, variety of topics, including getting started on your KCS journey, establishing and sustaining a KCS coach program, uh, measuring the value of your KCS enabled digital transformation, to name a few. And we're going to be posting these events shortly, and we'll include the links to these events when we send out the recording, the presentation, and the chat of today's event later this week. And for today's um, KCS Vendor Series, I'm pleased to introduce Sariel Moshe. And Sariel is the co-founder and chief product officer at XFind. And XFind is one of our KCS uh, V6 aligned tool vendors. And Sariel is also KCS V6 Practices certified. And so Sariel will be discussing delivering knowledge in the post-search world of AI. And this has been a, a hot topic on a, a number of uh, conversations. So really looking forward to this. Um, but some housekeeping before we begin, please put yourself on mute during this event and please post your questions in chat. And I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll either bring them up as appropriate to Sariel in the flow or I'll save them for the Q&A session at the end. And again, we're going to send out the chat log, the recording and the presentation to all who have registered. And I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Sariel. Thank you so much, Arnfin. Um, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your very busy schedules uh, to jo join us today. My aim in this session is to provide you with a clear guideline of how we at XFind are seeing generative AI uh, and how it's going to redefine customer support over the next few years. Uh, I'll try to discuss what it will or what, what it will not be able to do, what are the current capabilities and the shortcomings, uh, and what we think you should be you should start doing about it today. Uh, please feel free to uh, post in the chat your questions and your observations. And just to explain that I chose this topic for the webinar because my belief is that we at XFIND, uh, based on what we've been doing over the past few years, uh, have a good view uh, ahead of, a bit ahead of the curve of where this is going, where AI is taking support uh, and what we think uh, support teams and, and enterprise knowledge in general, uh, what you can do about it in order to, to stay ahead and, and to be on top of things. So that's really my main focus for today is to discuss, is discuss that. Uh, a bit about me, uh, Sariel, I'm a co-founder and chief product officer at XFind. I originally got hooked on solving knowledge issues uh, actually in mil as a military intelligence officer. Uh, I later decided that uh, I wanna build some technology around that when I discovered that the exact same issues sort of repeat themselves in multiple uh, enterprise settings, uh, the issues of reaching knowledge and delivering knowledge. Uh, so that's that's how I got into this in this field in the first place. And a bit about XFind, 
So what we're doing at XFind, we're aiming to supercharge customer interactions with enterprise knowledge. Uh, the basic insight uh, is that customer support journeys are mainly a process of knowledge acquisition, both on the customer and the agent side, and that that journey, that uh, knowledge acquisition journey can be made much more seamless with better knowledge delivery capabilities. Uh, KCS, and I've told this to Arnfin quite a few times, serves in many ways as a guiding, um, guiding method uh, for XFind. Uh, because we're at the end of the day, we're aiming to serve the same end goal, which is bringing the knowledge to where it can serve both customers and the support teams themselves. So starting out, uh, and I'd like to start out with a quick poll just to test the level of trust uh, all you people uh, have of the current capabilities of AI. So Arnfin is going to bring up a poll and, and feel free to, to answer uh, in time, and I'm curious to see. Um, so just to, to read out the, the, the question, how long will it take AI to answer most complex customer issues on its own? So this is, these are pretty interesting results and, and they, they go along with what I've, I've been hearing um, a lot. Uh, over the do, you past want to, do you want me to end the poll? We still have a few that uh, are... Yeah, we, we think we still have a few. Um, you know, let's give it a few more seconds. Any, any of you who still want to uh, respond? That looks like they got them. Yeah, great. So, so, so what we're seeing here is that... Uh, there is a belief that that AI will be able to to do this on its own. Uh, actually, um, I'm surprised at the number of people who think it's going to happen that quick over the next uh, one or two years. Um, most people I've I've spoken to on uh, 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 previous polls I've run were a bit later, but I think as as we're seeing the capabilities um, uh, improve over the past few months. Since I think ChatGPT was probably the big uh, the big thing that happened to start this uh, this discussion, um, so I think people are getting more confident in AI's capabilities. Um, so moving on from this, um, what I believe is going to happen, uh, I'm 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 not in the one to two uh, year um, uh, team. I'm more in the three to five year, but I do believe that around eighty percent of what support teams today are doing across the board is going to be fully automated in a five in five year time. Uh, and more than that, I think this is the crucial part of it. I think that I believe that support teams will not uh, will not be support teams anymore. They'll actually become knowledge teams for, for the most for the most part. Um, and 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 this this is exactly what, I, what I'd like to explain as we go on why why I think this is this is going to happen. Um, so just to set out uh, uh, the points that I'd like to cover. So first of all, support in general. Um, what what are we talking about? We're talking about support today. Uh, generative AI. A, a basic intro for those uh, who who may not be aware of the different term terminology. Um, Gen, AI, Gen AI and support, what it's going to look like. Um, how does that future play out? How you can control it and uh, clear takeaways. Uh, I, 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 I want to, to come away with clear takeaways that you can do with your companies, with your organizations, with your teams today to start moving forward and enabling these, uh, these capabilities uh, for you. Uh, so Arnfin, before I, I move forward, uh, I'd like to hear your your view um, as part of the consortium on on what is what support is today. What are we talking about when we're talking about customer support in 2023 in general? So we definitely see support uh, as for those who are doing it well as as really um, serving up knowledge. So that lends itself very, very nicely to in this requester responder relationship, serving up answers to people's questions, um, solutions to people's issues, et cetera. And it's um, 
lends itself very well to the AI capabilities. So we see that um, customer service, IT support, HR, et cetera, anywhere where you have really knowledge-based um, interactions, we see are gonna be taking advantage of this and be some of the early adopters. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, to bring that a bit uh, more down into specifics, um, so I, I, this is the, the, the way I think uh, we discussed this, Art and Finn, the way that the consortium, um, you know, sees the different types of support. Um, so we have reactive versus proactive and predictive. And most organizations, uh, based on my experience, for sure, with talking to hundreds of, of companies over the past few years, uh, most organizations are in the reactive uh, side of things. So reactive is they ask, the cu your customers ask, you answer. Um, and, and, and some companies are, uh, are developing capabilities around the proactive and predictive, where it's uh, uh, detecting the risks, detecting um, upcoming issues and solving them before the customer comes in. But I'm gonna be focusing today on, on the reactive side of things where, where the vast majority uh, of companies are. And what I want to discuss with AI is how do we take that reactive side of things and automate it? Um, and by automating really the, the number one um, aim, the number one goal is how do you solve a new issue once and then have automations take over the, and do the rest? Yeah. Uh, and and let's, let's get into that. Yeah. So Sarl, you had, I, no, I apologize, Sarl, you had mentioned and when we were talking before how the consortium sees the automation and, and such, mm -hmm. and we certainly talked about connecting people to people for new issues and people to knowledge for known issues, and then mm -hmm. leveraging self-service automation and predictive capabilities to shift these issues left and ideally problem elimination. Um, and I think with uh, AI, our definition of new issues will have to be further refined. Um, and I think you're going to touch on that later in our talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and this is to get um, a feeling of, uh, before I dive into the, the technicalities and, and technological stuff, uh, a feeling of, of how, um, how deep I should be diving into that. Um, uh, how how much you're you're aware of 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 these different uh, the terminology and and what's going on in this technology? So uh, let's give this a few more seconds. And I, I think okay, I, I think I'm getting the picture. So uh, most have some somewhat of an understanding uh, of of the technology, which is which is great. Um, so. Yeah, I think we can, we can end it. And um, so I'll start out with stating the obvious. Um, you've heard it all before. The world has changed. Uh, I remember once the, the day after ChatGPT came out from OpenAI, I went into the office and I said, "Okay, the you know our our, our market is changing. Has changed drastically over the over the last night." Um, so I'm not here to state the obvious. I, I'm really aiming to explain how we think it's going to play out. Um, but to start, I, I just want a quick overview of, of the terminology and, and how the technology works. Um, what I, if there's one takeaway I want you to take from this slide, it's that uh, general artificial generative artificial intelligence, Gen AI, it's not dark magic. Uh, it does not have a human understanding, a human level understanding of the world, but it is able to do some very crazy stuff, uh, nonetheless. Um, so basically. Large language models are, are the technology behind generative AI, uh, at least on a textual level. Uh, and what they're able to do is um, they're able to, to learn how to imitate human language uh, by pretty much capturing its statistical model. Now, obviously, uh, natural human language is very, very complex. And that's why capturing the statistical models that explain the representation of different terms and sentences in comparison to one another and how to build language or, or uh, how to build out um, uh, answers or, or knowledge in general that makes sense. Uh, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. You, you have to use a lot of training data and that's why these are called large language models. Uh, some, some part of it is because the amount of data they need to train on 
and and some part of it is because the the amount of neural networks involved in uh, in training them. Uh, and GPT, just uh, to explain, is a subset of, of this. Uh, so GPT is generative pre-trained transformers. It's a type of technology of, of a large language model that was developed by OpenAI, and it's what powers the ChatGPT application, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware are uh, uh, have played around with at least. Um, and why is this so important to support? Uh, so generative AI um, provides computers with the ability to pretty much generate an answer to any question in human-like form. Uh, and that's the number one um, new capability that's come out in the past few months that hasn't been around before. Uh, and that really changes around how we, how we approach knowledge and how we think about knowledge, especially in support. Why especially in support? Um, so just one poll, one, one more poll, uh, and this is to, to understand where you guys are with regards to uh, AI adoption. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear, um, are you actively uh, deploying or, or planning to adopt AI uh, at this moment uh, in time? Um, and um, yeah, and th th that'll give me a, a good understanding of um uh, where where you where you where you people are uh, are at and how to how to how to better to explain uh, where I think it's going. So so I, again I, I see oh it's it's pretty interesting again because it seems that uh, at least a third about a third are working on actively deploying AI which is um, which is higher than I expected I have to say uh, and then uh, another about half are uh, have some activity around it. Um, so that's, well, I guess it makes sense also people who, sh who showed up to the webinar are people who are actively looking. Um, so, um, yeah, so I I'm, I'm going to jump straight into this and, uh, I'm going to jump straight into, uh, what I see, um, the, the flow looking like with, with generative AI. Um, I just want to make sure I didn't forget any slide. Right. Yeah. No, I did. Um, yeah. So, so actually, maybe Arnfin, uh, before I, before I, I move ahead, uh, where does the consortium see uh, generative AI impacting customer support? What, what's your take on that? So we we definitely see that you know to your point on this slide that. Uh, Customers want a conversational experience. They want to engage, um, not necessarily to an agent, but they want to be able to form their question and get an answer, define their issue and get an answer. And uh, so we definitely see for known issues um, that uh, AI is going to be very supportive of that. And as you pointed out earlier, it is dependent on knowledge. So people really have to redouble their efforts on creating structured knowledge. So we definitely see. PCS is a critical enabler. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the reason support, uh, and I'll say it in my words, the reason support really is at the forefront of, 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 of the, the impact of generative AI in, in general. I think it's, it's probably the, the, the most um, relevant use case that, that, that has come out of this new technology. Uh, uh, over anything else is is because it's really at the um, at, at, at right in the middle of the combination between the ability to take in a lot of knowledge and then answer questions using it, and, and that's pretty much what support is all about, right? Um, so customers constantly want, and this has come up in in many polls. Uh, in the past, Cus customers want the conversational experience. They, they don't want a keyword search, um, but they do want to be able to describe their issues very simply and get an answer. On the other end, uh, they don't really necessarily want it to come from an agent, right? Uh, they, they would actually much rather be able to self-serve. Uh, and the, the support teams themselves also would much rather be able to do more with less, not having to uh, onboard more and more agents, but you know, the existing team can take care of, of more issues. And on the manager level, managers are always expected to be on top of things, especially in support, because it's so crucial to 
how customers view the company. Uh, so they're, they're expected to be on top of things and be able to say what is going on and how do we answer it as best as possible. And, and that's why when we connect all those dots, uh, it's, it's obvious that if you're talking about a system that's able to take in a lot of knowledge and then answer questions, customer support is going to be the first use case that that's, it's, it's going to come into play with in the enterprise. Um, taking it further than that, um, so, uh, and th this is uh, obviously uh, the consortium has been saying this for a while, uh, but to, to bring it even further, knowledge is not just central to support. No, support is knowledge, right? Uh, uh, most of the processes that support teams are doing in the day-to-day surround knowledge. From hiring, you're hiring a, 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 a based on who can learn, who can onboard quickly and, and learn the, the, the relevant uh, knowledge that's needed to solve issues. Triage and intelligence warming, it's all about getting to the people who know uh, how to answer these issues. Uh, the, the, obviously, the search systems and the analytics, all of that is around, uh, it surrounds knowledge. And then once we have a system that potentially is as smart as your smartest escalation engineer and can generate an answer based on all the knowledge you have in place to any question posed to it, it's pretty obvious that it, something's gonna change around and support it. I think that the poll earlier really showed that uh, the people on this, uh, on this webinar understand that. And, and now the question is, what does that look like, right? How is this gonna play out? Um, so now, now we get back to that, that slide I, um, Right, and just to, again, to, to state, it's a bit to state the obvious, but I'll say it anyway. Um, we're heading to a world where most customer issues, even in complex B2B type scenarios, are gonna be solved in seconds and not in days, right? If today uh, many co companies have come across, still they're like, they, they measure average resolution time in days, uh, that, that's, that's gonna disappear. Uh, that's, not, that's not gonna be around much longer. Um, but but how does that, that play out? So. Uh, if you go back to this slide, um, so what does it look like? What does the flow look like? So using the the, the, the consortium's uh, solve and evolve loops as a framework, uh, potentially what we're talking about, um, and this is another takeaway uh, I think that could be valuable, is, is just imagining what this can look like. Uh, so a customer describes their issue. Uh, again, we're talking about the reactive support here. So we're, we're not in the proactive predictive Customer does have to come in and, and describe their issue, but at that point already, we have AI kicking in. So first of all, there's a decision to make. Do we have relevant knowledge to answer this, this question or not, this issue, right? If we have relevant knowledge, you know, come in, please, generative AI and answer it, right? We don't need, uh, we don't need this to get to a support agent at all. Um, but if relevant knowledge does not exist, it does, it does have to go into an agent. But then on the agent level, uh, generative AI, and this is another capability that's very good at, is summarizing the complex knowledge. You just give it you know, the case and ask it, please summarize this for me, uh, what's going on in this case, and suggest a response. That response can be based on um, any knowledge that's out there. It can be based on past cases. It can be based on a lot of information that does exist, even if it's unstructured, right? Uh, and then that summary and a suggested response then turn into knowledge items by themselves, right? It's exactly the, the, the KCS idea. You summarize the issue, you create a response, turn that into a, a draft article and push it, out, push it straight out to your, to your, uh, to your knowledge uh, uh, base, your help center. Well, at this point, we don't really need a, a help center anymore where people are going to be, you know, keyword searching because we have this generative AI uh, tool that can take that knowledge and then serve it up as answers. So no more items, it's just straight to answers. And then if we look at the evolve loop of things, AI is playing a big role here as well. So first of all, uh, AI, and this is not necessarily generative AI, it's, uh, uh, it can, com can be combined with uh, other, other forms of machine learning that already exist, uh, but the idea is to detect overlying case trends uh, to summarize the knowledge over these trends, make sure that on the other, on one end we don't have duplicates, but on the other hand we don't have knowledge gaps, um, and then feed those summaries as part of the, the the general knowledge base as well. And then that general knowledge base again is answering the questions coming in, 
So very quickly, you're reaching a, a, a level where any new case coming in is quickly summarized, answered, becomes a knowledge, uh, a knowledge item, served into the generative AI tool, and then it's answering any, any new, any additional question coming in on that topic will be answered automatically. So th this flow is like, based on this, I think uh, people who maybe didn't believe what I said earlier about 80% of current customer support work going away, being automated, now you understand why, why I said that. Because um, generative AI is, taking, is gonna be taking part in almost every step of the way of getting the case, figuring out if knowledge exists and answering the issue, and then creating the knowledge that's needed to answer the issues that haven't had knowledge in, before. So really th this entire flow is gonna become almost totally automated. And at this point, I'm, I'm guessing that some of you, those are, who maybe are a bit better versed in, uh, in the world of, of generative AI are, are asking, well, what's the, where's the catch, right? Um, why, why hasn't this happened yet? If, if generative AI is so amazing, there, there must be something missing here. Um, and, and there is a catch. Um, and the, the catch is uh, that large language, model, large language models are, are a tricky bunch um, and they don't really abide by the rules. Um, so th this goes back to the, the technology I described earlier. So the, there are a few big issues with large language models. Uh, and like with any engine, large language models are super powerful engines that, that can spit out text uh, very, very precisely and very confidently. Like with any engine, the more powerful the engine is, the more precise you have to be when working with it. Uh, and large language models um, are very confident liars. Uh, they're trained out to spit out very convincing text, but regardless of accuracy and validity. Uh, they only know what you train them on. And even that information that you train them on, that knowledge, right? They don't really have any commitment to actual reality. They're, they're just trained to answer questions convincingly. Um, so th th that is a very big issue, obviously, when, it, when we're talking about customer support. You want to be able to automate the answers you're giving to your, your customers, but you want to make sure that it's fairly accurate and, and not just making up stuff. Um, now, an, another big issue, and this really has to do with the fear that I'm, that I'm hearing out there from many companies uh, with regards to implementing um, generative AI, is the fact that most solutions out there today, uh, and this is this probably will change over the coming year or two, but today, most solutions that can be implemented out of the box uh, if you want to train them, that means you're sharing very sensitive information with a third party that can then use that information uh, as part of the model that you're training. Um, and there are different solutions to that, uh, but they're not really out there yet uh, in, a, in a way that can be uh, safely used enough. So uh, if we're talking about doing it yourself, out of the box solutions, so pretty much it sums up to they're too generic. Uh, they don't really uh, care about your specific lingo, your specific information. It's pretty costly as well in developing them and they're not secure enough uh, for, for many of the enterprise settings that we're talking about. And, and, and that, that's what brings me to, uh, I, I think maybe the main takeaway um, of, of today, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on this uh, on this slide quite a bit now, uh, just to explain how the, the the flow that I described earlier, how I think it really is going to play out, um, and and why uh, we shouldn't be uh, thinking of humans uh, leaving the scene, but rather they're very much going to be part of the scene. The big question is, what are they going to be doing uh, as part of this flow, right? So. Uh, main issue is the validity issue, right? If, if we um, uh, leave the security and privacy issues on the side for, for a bit, 
Uh, the main issue is validity. Are, are you serving up valid, valid knowledge to your customers? Uh, uh, the ground truth, in other words, uh, is, is your model able to uh, know, understand, or, or use only knowledge that, that is really ac actually accurate and relevant? And that requires human oversight. That, that you can't just leave it to, an, to, to uh, any generative AI model uh, to do by itself. It, need, it requires some human oversight. What does that human oversight look like? So first of all, and we already, we already noted this, um, those 20% new incoming cases, they're still going to need someone to, to, to answer them, to solve them. So, so that's not going away anytime soon. Um, we're still going to be uh, having people. Uh, um, so if you don't have any knowledge in place, obviously, to serve up to any model to use, uh, then it won't be able to answer anything uh, relevant to that issue. Um, but more than that, uh, the, the big uh, issue here is the structured knowledge, uh, structured knowledge or clean and up-to-date knowledge. And I'll use here the term that I like to use with regards to this issue, which is promptability uh, or making knowledge that is promptable. Um, and, and let me first explain the, the technical side of it. And then I, then I think the, um, the, the flow, the process side of it will, will be a bit easier to understand. So there's two general approaches to how uh, to implement uh, large language models and generative AI in order to answer questions. The first is the one I really touched upon most uh, until now was the idea of training the model. So to train the model, as I noted earlier, you need lots of, uh, of training data, training data being uh, uh, in, in a simplified manner. Uh, uh, if you have lots of questions and the answers to those questions, you can feed those into the model for it to learn how to connect between these questions and these answers uh, in a very smart way. Uh, and, and then learn to do it in additional types of scenarios as well. Um, so th th that's one approach, which is, uh, it's called fine tuning in the, the technical term is feeding that, uh, that training data into the model. And again, that, that approach has all the issues that I just described, which is reliability uh, and, uh, and safety and privacy issues as well. There's another approach out there uh, that's been discussed over the past few months, uh, which is called question answering over docs. Uh, and, and this approach really plays very nicely into KCS. Um, and I'll explain why. So th the idea is it's a two-phase approach. Uh, it's not just moving totally over to generative AI, taking over and doing it all by itself. Rather, it's taking existing solutions in the smart search field. So search engines, but that can deal with complex types of questions, um, you know, that, that have a lot of terminology in them, not keyword searching, but you still have your, your customer coming in and describing their issue rather than trying to keyword search, asking the system a question. But the first phase, the first step that then the system takes is not spitting out an answer, but first retrieving relevant knowledge that you have in place, uh, relevant knowledge items as the first phase. And then the second phase is then you feed that or serve that up to the large language model, serve up the question and the relevant documentation and ask the not large language model, please answer this, this, uh, this question based on these documents that I found for you. So, Th that is a it's um so it, on the one hand it's an approach that is it's not like the cutting edge of the technology it does require more classic NLP uh, natural language processing capabilities but it can achieve similar levels of precision and it's much more reliable it's much more reliable because then you know that that answer that the the large language model is serving up what it's based on it's based on documentation has been validated that you know is relevant to this context. And um, the uh, basically again, so, so the, the, the if we uh, if we approach the use of large language models with this approach, with the two-phase approach, the question answering over docs, 
Now going back to the top of the slide, you can understand why uh, I think the main stress for any uh, organization that wants to implement generative AI into their processes, the main stress is really developing that knowledge. And that's not going away. That, that, that's not going anywhere, at least for the coming few years. Um, so in addition to uh, uh, generating that structured knowledge for those new issues coming in, you have to make sure that the existing knowledge you have in place is clean, up-to-date, and structured as well. Because once you have that knowledge that you can serve up to the large language model, then you can realize that flow, but with validation and security in place. And what that looks like is the following slide. So we're taking the, the same flow I, I, I described earlier, which is uh, customer describes their issue, we decide whether we have relevant knowledge, and then we have Gen AI, generative AI answering the issues and helping summarize and, and create the, the, the future knowledge as well. But overlaid on that is where you still need A, humans in the loop and B, more classic uh, natural language processing capabilities uh, in the loop as well. Um, so um, just to explain what we're seeing here again, this flow. So customer describes their issue. The decision as to whether we have relevant knowledge or not, that's a classic natural language processing decision. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a retrieval decision that has to do with uh, the capabilities of existing search engines, right? So do we have what to serve up to this question? Once we answer that question, then yes, generative AI can answer the question if we have relevant structured knowledge in place, but also for that, we still need to serve up the relevant documentation that it can use, that structured knowledge that it can use to answer the question. If we do not have relevant uh, structured knowledge in place, right, then it goes to the agent. And for the agent to be able to work on these issues much quicker, and that's another capability that generative AI can help in, but again, it needs to first be able to retrieve relevant knowledge. In this case, it doesn't necessarily have to be structured knowledge. It can be unstructured knowledge, for example, past cases, for example, existing Slack threads, uh, and any other relevant information that uh, the agent can use. But there has to be that knowledge in place, and it has to be something that's easily retrievable. Um, and, and now you can understand why, on the one hand, this flow is possible, this idea of customers describing their issues and relevant knowledge um, uh, being served up as, as answers and not as items. But on the other hand, you will need to, uh, to have humans in the loop, both in developing the relevant knowledge that can be served up and in uh, having agents obviously solve those new issues coming in uh, and, and developing the, the structured knowledge over there. Uh, so th th this is really a, a, a critical element in understanding how I think how we at XFind we're seeing this is going to be play this is going to play out over the coming one to two years. So so the the thirty percent of people who answer that they 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 do see this happening in the next one or two years. If I believe it's going to happen, it's going to happen in this way. I don't see uh, generative AI being able to just in complex issues for sure just serve up answers. Uh, you know, based on training on your Slack threads and past cases. I don't believe that's going to happen. What I do believe is going to happen is if you become better at structuring your knowledge, your the entire process, the entire support process is going to become much, much quicker, much more efficient using generative AI, serving up answers based on that structured knowledge. So I, I hope that was clear. Um, and at this point, uh, Arnfin, do, do we have any uh, any questions that have come up on this uh, in, in the chat? Yeah, we, we actually do. Uh, there are questions about um, the structured versus unstructured. Uh, mm -hmm. And that um, the comment was that AI works well with both unstructured and structured in training. And mm -hmm. so if you want to elaborate on that as one of the questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, it, so if we're talking, so 
there's two approaches to generative AI, uh, as I noted earlier. The, 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 one, the, the first approach is training the model, right? Training the model as is uh, to be able to answer um, uh, any, any question that, that, you know, any question that comes up. So when you're talking about training the model, that is correct that you can train the model using both structured and unstructured knowledge, right? For example, if you have uh, any type of question answering data, it can be thrown, even if it's not very well structured, into a training model for generative AI and fine tune that model. But uh, the, the issue with that is that you don't really have much supervision over, over how it's going to use that, uh, that, that training data when, it, when, when it's actually being asked questions. So they are, again, these, these, um, these engines are very powerful but they're quite hard to supervise. Uh, so uh, if you're taking the training approach, it is possible, that is true, but it's very hard to supervise, A. B, there are security and privacy uh, elements involved as well, especially if we're talking about uh, unstructured knowledge like past cases and Slack threads from your internal uh, discussions. Um, are you willing to share that with the existing, again, this is very relevant to today. In a year, a year from now, it might be a different scenario, but today, uh, still the, 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 the really powerful capabilities out there are third parties uh, that when you're training their models with your data, that data can then be pretty, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they, they might claim uh, in some cases that it's not gonna be used, but you don't really know, again, the, the, the issue here is supervision. Uh, yeah, you're not able to supervise as to how that data that you're then training the model on is going to be used later on. Uh, so that's why, even though it is possible, like noted in the chat, it's not the, the path I think most organizations are going to be taking. Uh, and uh, again, of course, you know, I, I will I will say that this is the, uh, the path I described here, which is the question answering over docs is the path that XFIND is uh, offering our customers as well. And it, the reason we're going in this path and not in the other one is because we believe that at least in the interim uh, phase that we're in, uh, which is we have a very powerful engine where we don't really know how to, um, how to best work with it yet. Uh, I think this is, the, this is the real way to go. By the way, developing structured knowledge is gonna serve training the systems later on much better than using unstructured knowledge. Um, because obviously training sets for large language models, uh, it, it is better to feed them with structured data that you can actually know um, how, it's gonna, how it's gonna serve the model rather than unstructured data. Uh, that, that's just another comment on that. Uh, if there's any other any other yeah. comments or questions, just know. as related to this, um, there's there's the question about environmental changes. So you might have knowledge on one environment, one version, etc., and now it changes. How right. are you the AI leveraging that with those changes to the environment? That's a, that's, yeah, that's an absolutely great question um, because it's something that happens all the time. And by the way, this has to do also with. The previous question, which is training, that's another reason why I believe that the training approach won't necessarily be uh, the best approach at this point. Um, so, uh, dealing with uh, changes in uh, in in products and in versions uh, is something that organizations are already doing today, right? You constantly have to update your knowledge uh, to serve um, uh, to serve the, the the newer versions and changes in product. Where I see that uh, playing out uh, in in the uh, process I'm describing here, uh, let me try to annotate um, that. Well, I'm not able to get my mouse over, but uh, so so what we're if you see the um, the box on the on the bottom right, so based uh, so suggesting a response based on achievement unstructured knowledge, let me, yeah. So actually now to summarize the case and suggest a response. So 
what I see uh, generative AI doing, and, and I'm going to note this in, in the next slide as well. What I see generative AI doing here is enabling agents who are going to be the ones who are going to be developing this knowledge to much easier um, detect the changes that, you know, that have to do with certain versions and structure the knowledge much quicker uh, than, than existing uh, processes in place. What do I mean by that? For example, a case comes in and the customer notes, um, right, I'm using this in this version and this came up, right? So uh, first step is retrieve, do we have any items in the past that have uh, discussed similar issues? Um, if we don't, let's summarize that, you know, okay, so, so and, and this is something that generative AI and large language models are really good at, right? Summarize this according to what version we're talking about, what product we're talking about, uh, and what is the described issue. Generative AI spits out that summary based on the case, based on what's described in the case, and then suggests a response based on, say, uh, a, a past case from maybe a, a previous version, but then the, you know, the agent can still de decide at this point, you still need a, someone to decide if that's a relevant response or we need something uh, different for this new version. But then you already have the summary of, okay, new version, what is the actual response? Click a button to turn that into a draft and here you have structured knowledge on that new version. Okay, so, so, so that process, instead of having to go out of your way, start a draft, and start noting all those specifics of, of this new issue, right? Generative AI already did that for you. Th that's how I see it playing out um, in, in this flow that I'm describing. Uh, I, ho I hope that was clear. And then a related question on um, with the AI tool to provide its sources. So when it's uh, providing an answer, um, what sources is it leveraging? How do you see that playing out? In yeah. That? I I, absolutely. So, um, so I, I, again, th this is the the, the two uh, the, the the bottom uh, purple box and the and the and the and the top purple box. There's there, there are two different flows, um, and really have to do with the types of sources we're using. So, uh, if we're talking about customers, we don't want to serve answers based on unstructured knowledge, at least not in my opinion, because uh, there's a good chance that that inf that information, even if generative AI is able to pull a relevant answer out of it, it hasn't gone through human eyes, and you want to make sure that you know it's actually valid. Uh, so the sources here will will be you know validated documentation, um, pretty much similar to to what today companies are using uh, in their external sources. Uh, but again, the 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 main difference will be that uh, creating that knowledge will be much faster and much easier. Um, with generative AI. When we're talking about internally for new types of cases uh, on the agent side, there, yeah, for sure, we're, we're going to be using unstructured knowledge, you know, past cases, uh, Slack threads, right? Th th these are all sources that uh, existing um, uh, uh, search capabilities like XFIND are able to provide based on very complex cases. Uh, so just to explain maybe a bit about what, what we do at XFIND is so we take a complex case, what, what we've been doing till today, okay? We, we, we take a very complex case, imagine a cybersecurity issue, uh, and then we're able to translate that into a query that can retrieve Slack threads, past cases, Jira bugs, et cetera, every, every item that's relevant to solving this case. Now, so when we're talking about internally for the agent side, uh, we take that information from those uh, unstructured knowledge items and turn them into a suggested response. But again, when we're talking about customer facing, I, I think at least at the first uh, in the first phase, um, when that's not going to happen, and we're still going to be um, basing the answers on structured knowledge that's been validated. But again, Beijing alternatively Romanized as Peking is the capital of the. Right. Um, so uh, we have 10 minutes left, and I, I want to uh, have enough time for uh, additional question and answers um, and for all you guys to share additional thoughts. Um, so let me just go to this slide. Um, 
takeaways and the three things you can do today. So first of all, takeaways. Um, again, this relates to the comment earlier uh, that um, large language models can be trained on unstructured data, very true. But I think we're still in a transitional phase where uh, for most organizations, that's not gonna be a reality. Um, and, and that's why uh, we, we, we still need to proceed with a bit of caution, but there are capabilities that can enable us to do that. Um, on the other end of things, obviously large language models, generative AI is transformational for sure. Uh, there's no question about it. And your customers and your users will, will come to expect it. So it, it, like in, in, if, if a year ago, um, right, customers were asking us, why can't we get Google-like search in you know internally for our, uh, for our enterprise a, a year ahead you know that's not going to be a question anymore it's going to be why can't we get the chat you know chat GPT experience internally uh, in in our enterprise so it's it, that's what I mean by transformational it's totally changing the way we we think of of knowledge especially internally in the enterprise um, as we noted reliability and data security issues are, are still uh, out there. Uh, and that's why I believe, and we believe at XFind, that the winning combination at this point in time is question answering over docs. Again, it's the two-phased approach. Use classic capabilities. I mean, I'm using the term classic, but it's it, it's advanced AI on its own. It's just not generative AI to be able to retrieve relevant knowledge items and then generative AI have it ride over those items to provide relevant answers. And now three things you can do today, and I think this is right, really the, the, the most critical part of it. What do you need to do today in your organization if you're, and, and a third of the people here are already working on implementing AI in organizations? What I think, uh, based on my experience uh, so far, what are the three things you need to do if you want it to, to work out for you? So the first is refocus efforts. Support organizations are very focused on, uh, to say it, mildly um, firefighting, right? You're, you're, you're constantly in the day-to-day -day trying to you know, solve your customer's issues and it makes sense, that's what you're there for. But if there's any time that you should sort of, you know, go out of your way to rethink your focus um, and start investing in, in, in improving uh, processes specifically around knowledge development, it's now. Um, Again, don't think that generative AI is this dark magic that you can just throw whatever you have at it and it's gonna work. It's not gonna work. You have to feed it with, even if you're trying to train it, you still have to feed it with relevant knowledge, uh, relevant data. Um, and uh, actually developing good knowledge, developing valid knowledge, it's not gonna become less critical, it's gonna become more critical. Um, and then other organizational efforts over time as we move into using generative AI more and more. Uh, that's a, a very important point. Uh, the second point is begin internally. So again, the, the obvious use case that everyone is running to, and it makes sense, is self-service for your customers. And that's what you're there for. You're there to answer their questions. But uh, the first phase, the first place to really try this out at least is your agents. Your agents are obviously the best assessors of any, any such technology. They'll know to see if it's bringing up relevant results, uh, relevant summaries, relevant answers. And they're the ones who are gonna be working with it in the future to develop knowledge and to feed the knowledge into the system. So they're, they're, the, they're the first ones who really need to take part in this process and assess and use uh, any capability that you're bringing in. And the third and probably most important, um, well, together with the first, but they, they, they both talk to the same issue, uh, is reassess your KPIs. Um, so uh, I think the consortium has been stressing this for quite a while, uh, that you know, foc don't focus on, on case-based measures, focus on service-based measures, uh, specifically self-service. Don't look at the you know average over cases. Look at the average over the number of cases coming in. Um, right uh, at the end of the day, what we're aiming to do is avoid cases, not serve cases. Um, so, so th 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 that's one KPI that you really need to start thinking about because again, 
uh, generative AI is mainly going to serve self-service. Um, uh, and, and you have to uh, adapt your KPIs to be able to assess, is it doing its job? Um, another important uh, point in that aspect, it's not a, necessarily a KPI, uh, it's not an indicator, but it is a standard. So, so start building your knowledge content standards. Uh, again, uh, at least in the interim phase, we are, uh, you are gonna have to serve up structured knowledge. You wanna make sure that whatever generative AI you're gonna use, is going to is going to actually be able to use that structured knowledge you're serving up. Uh, you want it to be up to date. You want it to be um, uh, well relevant and and valid. Uh, so th this is the time to start uh, start working on that. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think that that's probably the the bottom line of uh, for me of this entire uh, webinar. And uh, again, I'll thank you everyone for for, for your time. The bottom line is don't think generative AI is gonna take, take us away from knowledge work. It's actually gonna double down the knowledge work that we're, that we're getting into. And that goes back to my point at the beginning, support teams are going to become knowledge teams, right? Generative AI is mainly gonna take away the work on reactive case solving. Uh, that's where it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to do a lot of work by itself, but then you have to feed it with relevant knowledge. If you want to train it, train it. You're still going to have to put in, in place relevant knowledge to train it as well, right? That's going to be the focus for support for the coming years. Uh, so um, last but not least. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that we, we have three minutes left. Uh, if there are any questions or experiences that, that uh, you want to share in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear them. And, and you were just on your last slide, you were talking about looking at the content standard. There was a question in chat. Um, what sort of changes do you think need to be made in the content standard to have content that can be better used by AI? And being practices certified, you're very familiar with the the KCS templates, do you see those um, serving well as uh, structured knowledge or you, any recommendations for changes? I, I, absolutely. So, so um, this is an issue that, that, that exists in support uh, a long time, and, and here it's going to be stressed even more. Uh, support teams tend to build knowledge that, excuse me, that they understand, uh, that the agents understand. They don't necessarily build it in a way that customers understand. And again, large language models, they know to take that knowledge and spit it out, uh, but they're not going to know to use the lingo necessarily that your customers need. So I, I, again, this is another thing that it's always been true. It's going to be even more true now. Uh, if you want your large language models to uh, work well and be, be able to self-serve your customers well, you have to build your knowledge in a way that uses terms that they can understand. Um, now, generative AI is also good in translating. So translating between synonymous terms, for example, generative AI is very good at that, but you have to have that knowledge in place for it to be able to do that. Um, so I, I think that that's one very important point. That's a difference between existing uh, ways uh, knowledge is developed and support and, and where I think it needs to go. Right, and we're actually timing out. There is a number of unanswered questions. Do you mind, Sarah, if we work together and can answer some of these and then we'll send it out to the- Absolutely, team? yeah. And then what yeah. about uh, connecting with you via LinkedIn? Would you welcome connections? Yes, yes, I, I would love that. Uh, feel free to reach out, uh, Sariel Moshe on LinkedIn. This is my email as well, and this is our site. Um, uh, so really, um, uh, I'd love to hear any additional questions or, or thoughts or comments um, from, from anyone here um, later on. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you all very much for, for taking part and, and uh, making time for this. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope it was w well worth the time. Great. Thank you very much. And, and judging from the, the chat, it was definitely well worth the time. We had a lot of great uh, comments in there to reacting to you. So we'll get the, the chat uh, log out. We'll uh, answer the unanswered questions. And then we will also, the presentation as well as the recording, we'll send that out. So thank you all for participating. You have a great rest of the day.
Thank you.